So good to be with you this morning to once again hear another portion of God's Word. If you would, this morning, turn your Bibles over to Acts chapter 9. This morning, we are going to be looking at the conversion of Saul. Now, we know Saul went on to do so many great things for the Lord and for the cause of Christ. But before he became the Apostle Paul, he was a very, very misguided individual. So we want to this morning look at the life, the entire life of the Apostle Paul before his conversion and after his conversion and see how any of the things that happened in his life can apply to any of us for this morning. Throughout the book of Acts, we find so many great accounts of how people obey the gospel. We can read in Acts chapter 2, that great Pentecost crowd. In Acts chapter 8, the, the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 9, we can see how Saul, who we're going to talk about this morning, how he obeyed the gospel. We see in Acts chapter 10, we find the great man we know to be Cornelius. We also go on to see how Lydia, the Philippian jailer, and we know how Paul went on to, again, Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, to tell about his conversions. The book of Acts is filled with how men and women obey the gospel of Christ. All the way from the beginning of time, all the way from Genesis 1-1 up until the account in the book of Acts. We see so many great and marvelous things take place throughout the Bible. But when Acts chapter 2 begins, when the Holy Spirit endued these men with that power, Acts 2 verse 1 through 5, we see how these men, on this day Peter, he preached that great sermon on the day of Pentecost, and we know the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began to be established. This morning, we want to talk about a man who was willing to fight. He was willing to fight by any means necessary. What if I were to tell you this morning there was a man who thought all his life he was doing the will of God, but he was wrong? What if I were to tell you this morning there was a man who woke up one morning, and his only mindset was to go out and kill those which were of the way. He went down to Damascus to persecute Christians. He went down to Damascus to kill these individuals or put them into prison. But little did he know he was going to leave with something that I don't believe he saw coming. He was a completely new man. He was going to be a Christian. He was going to be a man who were just like the ones who he, who, to whom he was trying to kill. This man was a Jew. He was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, Acts 22 and verse 3. The son of a Pharisee. He had been reared as a Pharisee, Acts 22, Acts 23, verse 6. His life as a Pharisee was known to the Jews which were in Jerusalem. According to the race and religion, he was a Jew but he was also a Roman citizen. In some way, his father or one of his ancestors had attained this Roman citizenship, and thus, he was a Roman-born citizen. Acts 22 and verse 28. He was well taught in the law. He had been brought up in Jerusalem. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He instructed according to the strict manner of the law of his fathers. Acts 22 and verse 3. However, it was not enough to be a Jew. Everything he had known, everything he had been taught up to this point in his life really didn't matter. Just because he was a Roman citizen, it wasn't enough. Just because he had a great resume, it still wasn't enough. Just because in his heart, he believed with all his might that he was right, but it still wasn't enough. Why is that? Because he was not a Christian. We have so many great men and women who have done so many great things for the history of mankind. They have broken barriers we ourselves probably could never break in our lifetimes. But if they weren't a child of God, if they weren't a Christian, then it was in vain. This man has so much power, or he believed he had all this power. How many of us can think of people who think they have all the power? But as Christians, 
God has given us the power to go out and make disciples throughout the entire world. Notice the power we have in our hands with the gospel of Christ. God has given us his word. He's given us his God-breathed, inspired word of God. We have what God wants us to use to go and to save the word. That's power. If it's a power we have, it is the power to teach someone what they need to do in order to be saved. That's power. Think of all the answers. Think of everything about his life. But yet if he wasn't a Christian, him studying at the feet of Gamaliel, him being a Jew, him being a Roman citizen, all those things would mean nothing. But we know Paul would let Saul would let it go wrong and use those things to his advantage. And just pointing this out, even though he had all these accolades to his name, and you get over to Philippians 3, verses 3 down to verse 8. Paul says, I'm going to give all these things up. Why, Paul? Just so I can win Christ. And if you continue to read anything he went on to write, notice 1 Corinthians 1. Paul, an apostle. Paul, an apostle over and over again. But you know the one thing Paul was as well? He was a servant. Paul had all these accolades, but Paul simply wanted to be a servant of Jesus Christ. He told certain Jews, I was zealous for God, even as ye are this day, Acts 22 and verse 3. Being well instructed and zealous, he said, I advanced in the Jews' religion far above my countrymen, Galatians 1 verse 14. This man makes it clear that although it is important to be zealous, it is also essential that one can be informed as well. Being zealous combined with ignorance, can lead an individual to promote evil and hurt the good. The Jews who were persecuting this man after his conversion were zealous for God, Acts 22 and verse 3. Of whom the others he wrote, for I bear witness, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, Romans 10 verses 2 and 3. I bear them that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Zeal has its place but it does not substitute for knowledge or lack thereof. We cannot make up for a failure to study with an honest heart by only investing in our zeal. It's not going to be enough. We have to study and learn the word of God as well. So some may ask, who is this man we are talking about this morning? Who is this man who have all these accolades to his name? A gospel preacher, a servant of Jesus Christ, a Roman citizen, the one we know to be the Apostle Paul, the man, who wanted, the man who only wanted to do the will of the Lord but did it out of ignorance. How many people who we know right now who are so sincere, who are so honest in their character, who are members of these denominations, yet they do it out of ignorance? Wouldn't it be amazing if a child of God went to them and taught them what was right and what was wrong, then they can use that same zeal as a Christian. The man who will face so many trials in his life to come, the man who went on to write majority of our New Testament, the man who will teach us so many great things about himself, about the Christ, and about life as well. The Apostle Paul indeed was a good man. He went down to persecute the church. He went down to persecute those who were other way, but he left with something else. He went down to Damascus to kill innocent people out of ignorance, but he is going to leave a new man. He went down to Damascus to do the will of the Lord just as he thought in his own mind, but he is going to leave with something else. Saul went down to Damascus to persecute the church. He went down there to kill those innocent men and women. But he himself is going to become one of those people because of Jesus Christ. If you look in Acts chapter 9, the first six verses, we see how Christ, we see how Christ appears to Saul while he is on the road to Damascus. Now, I want to ask a very important question, because very often if we talk to people, they refer to Acts chapter 9. 
Romans 10, 9 is 10, ask these so-called sinners prayer. But here I have a man. We're going to get that later on, but let's just, let's, let's just examine the text for a second. In verse 4, the Bible says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prince. Why didn't Christ tell Saul what he had to do to be saved? Why didn't Christ just simply come into his heart? Why didn't the Holy Spirit, as so many of our denominational friends say, why didn't he just come into his heart and cause him to do something? But as we, see, as we clearly see in the scriptures, as we clearly see throughout the New Testament, as we clearly see throughout the book of Acts and how men and women were converted, it's just simply not the case. There must be something else involved in order for us to be saved. Wasn't Noah saved on his good deed and his good intentions? No, he was not. Noah was saved because he did exactly what God told him to do, and he did not question it. It doesn't matter what we believe in our own minds. It only matters what God has already told us through his inspired word. In order for us to be Christians, there are so many things that take the place. There are so many things involved in with that formula. This man, Saul, had indeed been working. By anyone else's standard, Saul could have easily worked his way into heaven, as so many often say. This man, Saul, had indeed been doing so many great things, but he was headed into the wrong direction. But because he went down to Damascus, his life was about to change because he was about to be introduced to the Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How many of our friends we know right now, we remember them before they were converted and after they were converted? Think about your own life. Think about how you were before you became a Christian and how you are right now. If anyone would look back at the person you used to be, they would say, well, who's that person? Who's that person? I, I, I can't even recognize the two people. Why is that? Because of Jesus Christ. You see, all these individuals who are living in sin, all these individuals who are lost, all these individuals who have no hope whatsoever, it is our responsibility to introduce them to Jesus. Very often if we talk to people and they are sick, we refer them to the certain kind of doctor they need. If they have headaches or whatever it is, we refer them to the doctor that can help them out the most. But what about the person who's lost in sin? What about the person who was on their way to hell? What about the person who is living a life of sin each day of their lives? Who we are supposed to introduce those people to? Jesus Christ. Jesus always takes us how we are, neighbors, but we never come back the same. He took Saul exactly how he was. But little did Saul know he was about to be transformed into a new individual. This man, Saul, only had one thing on his mind, and that was killing innocent people. As we live our lives, how many of us are looking to change? As we talk to our friends, our family members, our coworkers, some people sincerely are looking to change. Very often, we can be talking to an individual, and they say they're looking for something. They're looking for whatever it is. How many of us refer them to Jesus Christ? How many of us say, let's have a Bible study? How many of us say, hey, come with services to me? You will be amazed how something that simple can transform someone's life. Someone had to invite you to services. Very often, very often, people are not as fortunate to grow up in the Lord's church. So those who are not as fortunate, someone had to introduce you to Jesus Christ. Why don't we have that same zeal? Why don't we have that same compassion? Somebody had to help us, so why won't we use that same compassion to help someone else? That's being kind. That's kindness. And that's exactly what Christ was. 
but something we so often forget. The same gospel Paul preached. The same gospel Timothy preached. The same gospel they used to convert people in their day is just as strong as it is today. But we have to give it to them. Very often people think we need new technology. We need a new gospel. We need all these different things that are going to attract our young people. Our young people do not need to be entertained. They need to be taught. Our young people need not to know what's going on in the world, but how we can help them with the word of God. There are so many young people right now. Sunday morning, we had Bible class here with the teens, and I was telling them when I graduated from school, my graduating class with the church, it was 16 of us. Right now, there are only six of us that are still faithful to God. And I so often ask myself, why is that? Was the foundation not laid for them? Was their foundation not built on Christ? What simply happened to those individuals who are no longer faithful to God right now? They simply gave up. They simply let the devil overtake their lives. And if they do not repent, they are going to lose their souls. How many people whom we love right now, who we care for so much, who were once Christians, who are not right now? It is our responsibility to go get those Christians. I guarantee you, if every Christian that has been baptized at that local congregation will come on Sundays, we would need three or four buildings to fit all the people inside. Yes, sir. We would need more preachers to preach to the people. We would have to have services all day for these individuals, these Christians. But why is that not happening? Because somewhere along the line, they gave up. But if it's one thing that can get them back, neighbors, it is the word of God. You want to get someone back to services? Have a Bible study with them. Encourage them. Plead with them. Pray with them. We miss you. Come back to services. If it wasn't for the gospel, we would lack strength. If it wasn't for the gospel, we would lack knowledge. If it wasn't for the gospel, we would lack hope. If it wasn't for the gospel, we would lack everything. That's why we need Jesus the most. Yesterday, I believe it was Brock who made a comment about the, the, the man who has the commercial. And on the commercial, he has his alcohol. He has all the women. At the end of the commercial, they say, the most interesting man in the universe. That's a lie. Jesus Christ is the most interesting man in the universe. Amen. Jesus Christ is the most interesting man that has ever lived and that ever will live. Why? Because he died on that cross for our sins. Amen. He is the son of God. And that's why we need to seek him the most. But because of Christ, because of the word of God, we have that knowledge. We have that hope. We have that strength. We have everything our hearts can ever desire because Christ has given us to us. All we have to do is accept his will. If it wasn't for the gospel, Saul's situation would have been hopeless. If it wasn't for the gospel, Saul would have been doing everything out of ignorance again, but he would just been doing it on his way to hell quicker. All those things he did didn't matter, but even though he was an evil person, even though no one wanted to deal with him, Christ saw him as a chosen vessel. How about that? How many men I know of, I can think in my mind right now, who done so many evil things in their lives, whatever it is, but right now they're deacons, they're elders, they're preachers, they're Bible school teachers. Why is that? Because they allowed the word of God to penetrate their heart. They allowed the word of God to show them what they need to do in order to live a new life. How did Lydia become converted? The Bible says her heart was open. How was her heart open? By the word of God. Hebrews 4, verse 15, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged source. If it's one thing that can penetrate the sin-sick heart of man, it is the word of God. And it always will be the word of God. The word of God is the only thing that can save this world. 
Very often we wonder what is going to get the world, the countries back to God. It's going to be the very same thing we had in the beginning, which was the word of God. Amen. We don't need anything new. We need that which God has already given us. Amen. His word. If his word is truth, if his word is just, the Bible says in Hebrews 6, verse 18, and also Titus 2, verse 1, God, Titus 1, verse 2, God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. So I'm going to trust him even more. I'm going to trust everything he wants me to do because I want to go to heaven. And if you want to go to heaven, we are going to do thus saith the Lord. Not only was an opportunity down in Damascus, but salvation. Today, again, it seems like we're looking for something other than the gospel. But all we need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul was persecuting the saints, the Christians, the believers, those who were other way, Acts 22 and verse 9 and verse 14. However, these saints were members of the church, which is the body of Christ. One cannot persecute the body without persecuting the head, which is Christ. So when Christ said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In the mind of Saul, he thought he was just persecuting the individuals, but in actuality, in actuality he was persecuting the Christ. To persecute the head is to persecute the body. To persecute the body is to persecute the head as well. They're all one and the same. Paul thought he was doing, Paul, what Paul thought he was doing he just thought he was killing innocent people, but little did he know he was persecuting the Christ. But doesn't that sound familiar? Over in Acts chapter 2, in that great chapter, the Jews here thought, well, we don't have anything to do with what's going on. But what did Peter say? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that that same Jesus whom you crucify, the Lord have made him what both Lord and Christ. And when they heard it, they were pricked. They were cut to the heart. They said, Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter told them what they needed to do to be saved. And it's rather amazing. Think of all the sins we have committed in our lives. Think of all the wrongs, all the lies, all the evil things we have done in our lives. But notice what Christ said. Notice what Peter said to the Jews. After he just told them they killed the Messiah and they asked, what shall we do? He said, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And people will ask, is that it? You mean I don't have to do anything else but just be baptized and live the life he wants me to live? I don't have to do all these other things. No. He simply said, repent and be baptized. Saul was a persecutor, a man who was wanting to kill the innocent. But one thing we see about Saul is that he went from being a persecutor to the persecuted. He went from one who was persecuting innocent men and women to he himself now being persecuted. I wonder how he felt. I wonder what came into his mind while he was persecuting, well, while he is being persecuted. But Paul said, we're going to see later on all those things were just light affliction. After the stoning of Stephen, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. Saul was going home after home, casting men and women into prison, as 8, verse 1 through 3. As Saul drew near to Damascus, a great light from heaven, a, brighter, the light, a light brighter than the sun came upon him, Acts 9, verse 3, 22, and verse 6. This took place around noon. And notice this, Saul was blinded for three days. Just want to throw this point out there. Saul was lost at the beginning of those three days. Just, he, he was just as lost as the end of those three days, just as he was in the beginning of those three days. Very often people say, if I just pray the sinner's prayer, if I just say, ask Lord Jesus to come into my heart, I'm going to be saved. But here I have a man who was praying three days and he was still lost. So that shows me that can't be true. The longer I pray, the longer I ask God to come into my heart, it's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. I have a man here, an honest man, who was praying three days. 
but he was still lost. Those who were with Paul did not see the Lord, but they did see the light and they were afraid. Acts 22 and verse 9. And he fell upon the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul asked a question, and he indeed got the answer. Saul did, I, did not know or identify the voice that came from heaven unto him. To identify himself, notice what Jesus said. He didn't even refer to himself as the Son of God. He could have. He identified himself as Jesus, the historical person who Saul had thought, whom Saul had thought was a false teacher. This was the same person Saul had likely heard Stephen mention when he called out, said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit at 7, verse 59. Can you imagine the look on his face? Just think about your own self. Think about what kind of look you will have on your face. This man who was persecuting, the man who did so much wrong, now Saul, this man is about to change his life. Just look at that, a man who was so evil. Even Christ wanted to save his life. Saul shows us a very important question. Well, Saul here is going to ask a very important question, and this is the question for each of us this morning. In verse 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What a great question. Probably the greatest question that can ever be asked. Lord, what will you have me to do? On the Damascus road, Jesus did not tell him what he needed him to do. Well, Jesus did not tell him except to go into the city and it was going to be told him what he needed to do to be saved. Although Saul had seen the Lord, he had not yet found peace. Christ did not speak Saul's peace. Well, Christ did not speak peace to Saul, soul on the road to Damascus. He did not tell Saul he was saved when he saw the Lord. When Ananias came to Saul, he did not tell Saul that he was already saved, but told him what he needed to do in order to wash his sins away, Acts 22, verse 16. Saul, in Acts 22, verse 16, after that, that chapter, after that text here, he has now been baptized into Christ. He has now put on Christ. He is now a new creature. He is now a Christian. He went from being persecutor to being persecuted. Paul will go on to do so many great things for the cause of Christ. He will go on to write so many encouraging messages, so many encouraging thoughts, but he would also warn those brethren as well what would happen if he did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul abundantly fulfilled the work to which Christ called him to do. He laid mightily and suffered intensely for Christ and humanity. He was indeed in laborers more abundant, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. And yet Paul, though he was a great man, he gave all the glory to God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. We can know so many more other things about the Apostle Paul, and we can stand in awe. We, we, we can just be amazed of all the great things he done. Paul was a great man of God. As Paul writes to the church at Philippians in chapter 4, now we know the condition what Paul was in. He was in Rome and he was in prison, but yet in the midst of all that, Paul still found something to rejoice about. He even says in Philippians 1 verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Even though his condition was not good in life, he still was happy for the brethren. He still was happy for those brethren supporting him, helping him, and what he was doing for the cause of Christ. When there is an opportunity, when we have heard the word of God, when we contact the blood of Jesus Christ, he will add us to his church. That indeed is something to rejoice about. As the apostle Paul will write to Timothy at the end of his life, when his work here on earth was about to be done, when his work here on earth was about to cease, he says to Timothy, he writes to all of us, for I'm now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I'll fought a good fight, I'll finish my course, and I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give unto me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearance. And all those things happened in his life because he found salvation when he went to Damascus. You're here this morning. What are you going to do? The question is being asked to you, what are you going to do right now with your life? We need not to wait. We need not to ponder. We need not to allow Satan to come into our minds and just hold the front port of the chairs, saying, I'm, 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 I'm not going to do it this time, maybe next time. Just let your hands go. Let someone take you by the hand and let's baptize you. Let's immerse you into the water grades of baptism, and you, just like Saul, can begin a new life. All those things started because there was salvation available for, the, for Saul while he was in Damascus. And salvation is available for each of us this morning, and we will just submit to the will of God. Thank you this morning. God bless. I will have-